first case was on December 15th. The latest was on January 9th. Police say that the victims left their cars unattended and unlocked in the driveway. I warm up my car just before I'm getting ready to get off because it's cold. Letting her car warm up in the driveway is convenient, but a string of car thefts in Katrina Smith's Woodlawn neighborhood has convinced her and her neighbors to ditch the cold weather habit. That's really dangerous. We come out and our car is just gone. They can take off so quickly, you know, just hop in and, and they're gone. By the time I go, you know, if I would have it on, run into the house, pick up something else, if they would be watching, it would just be gone. The suspect or suspects took off with a Cadillac SLS on Barb and Katrina Street on December 30th. And investigators say that four other cars were taken from the surrounding area over the past few weeks. These all appear to be thefts of opportunity that could have been avoided if the cars were left locked. Um, that's what car starters are for, remote starters are for that exact purpose. The latest case was on January 9th in the 2100 block of Amber Way. All of the cars were stolen during daylight hours, and although three of them have been located, investigators don't have any leads. They say the proximity of the cases gives them some insight into who they're looking for. Leads us to believe that there's a possibility that whoever is the thief is associated with that neighborhood some way, either is a resident, um, is a, a juvenile resident in the area, or is a friend of a resident that's in the area. And so police are still looking for that 2002 Cadillac SLS and a 2002 Mercury Mountaineer. Anyone with information about these cases should call Baltimore County Police at 410-887-1340. We're live in Towson tonight. Kyrie, WBAL, TV 11 News. Well, the city of Baltimore honored Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by hosting a parade today on the street named after the civil rights icon. Dozens of groups, including high school uh, bands and community bands, as well as fraternities and sororities and the NAACP, created floats or presentations for the spectators. And the theme for this year's parade was One Baltimore. And today, community groups in West Baltimore announced plans for a public-private collaboration called Innovation Village. It includes communities between Mondawmin and Coppin State University, MICA, and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. The goal to rehabilitate the areas damaged in the April riots and focus on creating jobs. Organizers are calling it an opportunity zone. Ultimately, what we sought to do was engage, include, collaborate, create, and activate all those human physical and economic riches that we have around us, which we see here today. We are laying a strong foundation for sustainable uh, change. Innovation Village organizers say they will also partner with existing community organizations. And now to Annapolis, where on this Martin Luther King Jr. Day, dozens of people gathered for an event in the civil rights leader's name, a reclaim Martin Luther King Jr. Day rally. Here's 11 News reporter Vanessa Herring. Organizers of tonight's rally are demanding strong police accountability reform legislation. Just last week, a legislative panel approved 22 reform recommendations to present to the legislature. We felt that it was important to reclaim his legacy and his message of racial justice and, and, and equality for all people throughout the state of Maryland. And, and today we focus on police accountability and reform. The backdrop for the Reclaim MLK Day Rally, Maryland's capital. There were a series of recommendations made by a work group convened by the, the Senate President and the Speaker of the House in Annapolis. And we're, we're looking forward to seeing what legislative proposals come out of those um, those recommendations. Last week, a legislative panel recommended changes to state law and standards to adjust the process officers must go through when accused of misconduct. Proposals to reform how police are held accountable within their own departments have failed in recent years in Annapolis. I just want to say to each and every one of you, the Black Caucus supports making sure that we hold the police accountable. A state law called the Law Enforcement Officers Bill of Rights is at the center of the issue. It offers police officers certain protections when they are accused of misconduct, excessive force, and other allegations that could lead to disciplinary action and dismissal. We say black lives matter, but laws do too. That's right. Because in right. civil society, there's no discipline without legislation and policies to answer to. Yet the law enforcement officers bill of rights in this state protects officers when they fail to protect us. 
Family members of people killed in police-involved situations were at tonight's rally, and it ended with a die-in. Michael, Baltimore City, Black. With the reading of the names of loved ones they've lost. Police union officials are watching closely, but they have not taken any position on those recommendations. Reporting from Annapolis, Vanessa Herring, WBAL TV 11 News. Well, the latest homicide in Baltimore happened tonight on the west side of the city. Officers were called to Fairview Avenue, not far from Lake Ashburton, for someone not breathing. When officers got there, they found a 42-year-old man who had been shot to death. Police aren't releasing his identity yet. They're still gathering information on a suspect and a possible motive. Firefighters in Prince George's County rescued a woman from a burning home in Temple Hills. She was rushed to a burn treatment center. Fire officials say she appears to have second-degree burns over 40% of her body. Investigators say the smoke detectors in the home was not working, and they believe the fire started in the basement. That's where firefighters also found the woman. No word yet on how it started. Well, a Baltimore man is now back home after surviving a deadly terror attack that killed 23 people in West Africa on Friday. Ed Bunker was working in Burkina Faso with an organization affiliated with Johns Hopkins to help strengthen health systems in the region. Terrorists targeted the hotel where Bunker was staying, setting off explosions and starting fires. A hotel worker spotted Bunker and told him to go back to his room. Hours later, special forces showed up. He was assigned a per personal protection officer. Physically covered me and also was was covering me um, uh, with his with his with his rifle and his and his and his position. I was highly appreciative of what of um, of of him literally kind of laying down his his himself to protect me. Attack, that attack was the first of its kind in Burkina Faso. A military forces ended the siege Saturday. Well, three of the five Americans freed in a prisoner swap in Moran are in Germany tonight. A fourth American, a student, was released separately, and the fifth chose to stay in Iran. Meanwhile, one of the seven Iranians pardoned in the exchange is a former Parkville resident. Ali Sabunchi was convicted in 2014 of exporting American-made American industrial products and services to Iran. The Federal Bureau of Prisons website shows he was scheduled to be released in November from a low-security facility in Virginia. And Iraqi security forces are scrambling to find three Americans believed kidnapped in Baghdad over the weekend. Iraqi government officials say the Americans were taken from the home of their interpreter, they think, in the neighborhood of Dora. The troops today closed streets and conducted house-to-house -house searches. Iraqi officials are also working under the assumption that a Shiite militia is responsible for the kidnapping. In commitment 2016, super political action committees, they're known as super PACs, and in the past they have played an important role in presidential campaigns. But are they really making a big difference in this primary season? Aix Adias explains from Washington. In political campaigns, money that can't go directly to candidates because of campaign contribution limits can go to super PACs. You can't talk to or coordinate with the actual candidates, so traditionally you play an outside role, you do your own research, you do your own television ads. One super PAC that has spent tens of millions of dollars this campaign season, Right to Rise, which supports Jeb Bush. But the cash hasn't translated into high poll numbers. The former Florida governor is struggling to reach double digits. You can't straight out by an election, but it helps you stay alive. Political analyst Mark Sandalo says while having a well-funded super PAC doesn't guarantee victory, the money certainly helps. It's very difficult to get your message out if you don't have the money to advertise on television, to fly between New Hampshire and Iowa. Two candidates with no super PACs, Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. One of the reasons I think that Trump is succeeding is he's not beholden to a lot of the donors. Sandalo says running a successful campaign without a super PAC is possible, but nowadays, rare. You can't do that if you're just a middle class or even an upper middle class person with some good ideas. You need millions and millions of dollars behind you. In 2010, the Supreme Court ruled donors can contribute unlimited amounts of money to groups supporting candidates as long as the candidates themselves don't control the spending. In Washington, I'm Aix Diaz. In 2012, Newt Gingrich became one of the first presidential candidates to take advantage of that Supreme Court decision. His well-funded super PAC made it possible for him to stay in the race beyond Iowa and New Hampshire after losing both states. 
Well, we've seen many, many videos from police officer dash cams. And tonight we've got a real good one for you. A dramatic video from a firefighter's helmet cam. Tense moments as he rescued an infant trapped in a flame-filled apartment. And a call by some to boycott the Academy Awards this year over a lack of diversity. The big names behind the push. And later, postal prices are going up, some as much as 15% when the new rates go into effect. And a wind chill advisory in effect with the possibility of some snow later this week. It's more like wintertime for sure. Insta Weather Plus coming up. Wake up with 11 News. Jason Newton, Mindy Becerra, covering Maryland's live local late breaking news. And Ava Marie and Sarah Caldwell getting you ready for the day ahead with weather and traffic on the ones. Weekday mornings on 11 News. Well, the firefighter's helmet camera captured dramatic rescue scenes in Fresno, California. Crews were called to a fire at a two-story apartment complex where they discovered a mother and her infant were trapped inside a second-story apartment. You can see as the firefighter climbs the ladder and hands the baby off to another waiting firefighter and then rescues the mother. Six other people were also rescued. No one was hurt. Wow. Well, there is a call tonight to boycott the Academy Awards this year after a second straight year of all white acting nominees. Spike Lee and Jada Pinkett Smith both announced today that they would neither attend nor watch the Oscars. On Instagram, Lee said he cannot support what he called the Lily White Oscars anymore. Pinkett Smith took her message to Facebook where she posted this video. Begging for acknowledgement or even asking diminishes dignity and diminishes power. And we are a dignified people. And the Academy has not responded. Well, legendary singer and songwriter Glenn Fry has died. Fry co-founded the Eagles and with a partner wrote massive hits such as Hotel California and Life in the Fast Lane. His family released a statement tonight reading, quote, words can neither describe our sorrow nor our love and respect for all that he has given to us, end quote. Fry was battling several health problems and had been ill for several weeks. He was 67 years old. Well, over to Flint, Michigan now, where the city's mayor is preparing a trip to Washington, D.C. to plead 
for a disaster declaration over water problems. In 2014, the city switched from Detroit's water supply over to the Flint River. Recent testing showed higher than acceptable levels of lead in both the water and the blood tests of children in that city. Michigan's governor requested a federal state of emergency, which President Obama signed. However, he denied a disaster declaration request because legally it has to be based on natural events such as floods, fires and explosions. The specific disaster declaration would free up more funding. Hey, you're planning on sending out some care packages? Well, as of Sunday, it'll cost you more. The U.S. Postal Service has raised shipping prices for Priority Mail and Priority Mail Express services. Priority Mail jumped about 10%, while the faster Priority Mail Express increased by about 15% on average. This is the first price increase for either mail service in more than three years. Chipotle fans, be warned, you may not be able to grab your favorite burrito on February the 8th. The Mexican food chain says it will close more than 1,900 restaurants on that day for a national team meeting with employees. Among the things to be discussed at that meeting, food safety changes that are being implemented following E. coli and salmonella outbreaks linked to Chipotle. There have been at least six outbreaks in the last six months. A federal investigation into the origins of those outbreaks is still ongoing. And the U.S. Department of Transportation released its annual list of on-time performance by U.S. airlines today. The results show that the on-time average for all airlines combined actually improved compared to November of last year. Hawaiian Airlines took the top spot this year with 93.9% .9 of its flights on time. Also in the top five, Delta, Alaska Airlines, United, American, and then there's the budget carrier Frontier Airlines, which ranked last with a 74% on-time average. Now, your 11 Inch to Weather Plus forecast with Chief Meteorologist Tom Tesselmeyer. I had to kind of chuckle today when I saw a weather statement come out of Key West, Florida. They said, bundle up, temperatures are going into the 50s tonight. <laughs> 50s! And they're going for the winter jackets down in South Florida. It'll be the first time Key West has been in the 50s since last February. So, I guess it is kind of chilly for them. 59 right now in Miami. Almost into the 40s at Tampa. Jacksonville, Florida is at 38. Lots of cold air nationwide. And then you get to the real frigid stuff. Ohio Valley, Mid-Atlantic, Northeast, all in the single digits, teens, and even some sub-zero readings. And the low for the day at BWI Marshall is now our current temperature. Dropped to 15 degrees as of 11 o'clock tonight. That's the new low for the day. The morning high was very early, 143 in the morning. So most of the daylight hours today, we were below 20 degrees, hovering around that 20 degree mark. It's been a very cold day, coldest one of the winter so far. Near zero out in western Maryland at this hour, low teens to our north, mid to upper teens on the eastern shore and down into southern Maryland. Winds, as you can see, are still gusting over 20 miles an hour in many locations. That brings the old wind chill into play with the Dangerous wind chills out west, 15, 20 below zero there, and below zero wind chills all around central Maryland, and now even down to Cambridge, they've got a sub zero wind chill. Advisories for that dangerous cold go until noontime tomorrow. Gusty winds and cold temperatures. Actual uh, thermometer readings, 8 to 15, but what it feels like on your skin, 5 to 10 degrees below zero when you get some of those stronger wind gusts. Skies clear overnight. Sunny skies tomorrow. High pressure stretches from near Chicago all the way down to Atlanta. That moves east, brings us sunny skies, but keeps the temperatures cold again. Then we'll keep an eye on a little clipper developing in the Dakotas. That may bring some flurries here Wednesday night. Stronger systems out in the North Pacific that we have to keep an eye on. Still way far out to the north and west, but we do think this system is going to come down across the south. The one coming off the Pacific will track through the south, somewhere toward South Carolina by Friday evening, and then expect it to make a turn up the eastern seaboard as a nor'easter, dumping some heavy snow somewhere here in the mid-Atlantic. Too early to tell exactly where that heaviest snow will be, but you can see the I-95 corridor certainly gets at least in on the fringe of that heavy snow. So late Friday into Saturday, the possibility several inches of snow here, something we've got to watch for a couple more days. Sunshine tomorrow, high temperatures still colder than normal. Winds on the bay strong enough for a small craft advisory with three foot waves. Mountain forecast sub zero tonight, only in the teens tomorrow and then 25 with a snow shower Wednesday. On the eastern shore, the winds are going to still be in play tomorrow, so that 28 feels a lot colder. And at the coast around Ocean City, we'll see a hint of a warm up midweek. Get above freezing Wednesday with some cloud cover in the area. Seven day forecast for Baltimore, about 28 tomorrow. Wednesday night, a chance for a snow shower. Lots of sunshine Thursday. But then here comes that possible storm coming up from the south. Snow developing Friday afternoon into Saturday. 
All right, Tom, if we must. Thank you. <laughs> Mission accomplished. The astronauts aboard the International Space Station say they have successfully grown the first ever space flower. I know, right? This success comes after several failed attempts to grow a zinnia because of mold development on the plant's leaves. But on Saturday, U.S. astronaut Scott Kelly tweeted this photo of the zinnia in full bloom. Of course, plants have been grown in space before. Back in 2014, space station crew members even began growing a veggie system there. Your veggies on Earth or in space, right? Well, the Terps will try to keep a slide in the rankings from also leading to a slide in the Big Ten standings. More on that next in sports. Good evening, Brandon Powell from the Maryland Lottery here, and with me is drawing official Harris Butler. Tonight's multi-match jackpot has an estimated annuity of $900,000. Here are your multi-match numbers for this Monday, January 18th. They are 7, 21, 5, 11, 1, and 14. Your multi-match numbers are 7, 21, 5, 11, 1, and 14. If no one matches all six numbers on any one line of a ticket, the multi-match jackpot climbs to $1 million. Next drawing Thursday night at 11.22 here on WBAL-TV 11. For all the latest lottery news and the winning numbers, visit mdlottery.com. The Maryland Lottery. Let yourself play. From the Jeep Sports Center, this is 11 Sports. Even a major beatdown of Ohio State on Saturday could not help the Terps get most AP voters to look past their tough loss in Michigan last week. Terps fall out of the top five in the national rankings.